So the next talk is uh, by Dr. Schipper, Heinemann Schipper. He is a professor of neurology and medicine, particularly geriatrics, at uh, McGill University, Montreal, Canada, a clinical neurologist at uh, Montreal's Jewish General Hospital, and the director of a neuroscience laboratory in the hospital's affiliated Lady Davis Institute for Biomedical Research. His research uh, focuses on degenerative diseases affecting the brain and mind, and he's the author of over 200 peer-reviewed papers on these and related topics. Professor Schipper has long been interested in the interface between contemporary science and the Jewish uh, mystical tradition, the Kabbalah. His work in this area was initially published at uh, Yeshva University's Torah Umada Journal, 2012-2013, and more recently in Unified Field Mechanics, Mechanics 2. Uh, edited by R. L. Amoroso, published by World Scientific in 2018, and Barilan University's DAAT, the Journal of the Jewish Philosophy and Kabbalah, 2019. Hyman, it's a pleasure to, to have you here. The word is yours. My name is Hyman Schipper, and I, uh, as was mentioned, I'm a neurologist uh, and a neuroscientist at McGill University, interested primarily in aging-related neurodegenerative diseases, um, such as Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, and more recently, schizophrenia. But as an Orthodox Jew, I'm also fascinated with the conflation of the modern sciences with the Jewish mystical tradition, uh, or Kabbalah. And that's what I'm going to try to uh, elaborate on today, uh, to try to convince you that uh, the Kabbalah is... Uh, panpsychist uh, long before the term panpsychism was in vogue. So in order to provide the appropriate context for what I'd like to say, uh, first I'd like to mention that there are different uh, ways of conceptualizing the relationship of God or the deity to the created universe. One way shown here on the left is that God created a universe but then he let the universe run on its own devices by its own physical law, with God playing very little role in what's happening today, and that is referred to as deism. Another view is that if you add up all the events and objects of the universe, basically you arrive at God himself and or herself, and that is uh, referred to as pantheism, such as Spinoza's conceptualization of religion. There is a third view where God creates a universe, but is both imminent within the universe, sort of like pantheism, but is also transcendent of the universe, uh, similar to deism. So in a crude sense, panentheism can be viewed as a combination of deism and pantheism. This uh, uh, third view is the traditional Jewish view of theology and certainly the Kabbalistic view. Um, important uh, concept to bear in mind, possibly the most fundamental concept in Kabbalah, is that everything in creation, be it an object or an event, is made of or is based on what are called sefirot, of which there are always 10 of them. As sefirah is the, is the singular, uh, can be viewed as an attribute of the deity or a property of God, or some refer to it as an information packet. And these sefirot are arranged hierarchically. Uh, at the top is keter, which means crown. And the higher you up in this hierarchy, the closer you are to the Godhead, which is referred to as Ein Sof, or the infinite in Hebrew. And the last of the sefirot is called malchut, which means kingship. And malchut's job is to act as a transducer that converts all of the divine influence flowing through this cascade into a final reality, which uh, uh, fulfills the will of God, which is based inside the sefirah of Keter. So this is the typical hierarchical flow of influence from on high 
down into whatever system you are uh, dealing with. In order to show you how the, uh, the, the Sephiroth came into being, it's important that I spend a minute or two showing you the Kabbalistic view of creation pre-Genesis 1-1. So this is a sort of before the Big Bang, if you will. It starts off with the infinite light of God. And when I use the word light, I'm using it capitalized because none of what I'm saying here in terms of physical properties are truly physical. They're just metaphors. There's absolutely nothing physical going on uh, in, the, in this slide. You have the infinite light of God. It re recedes from a central point, creating a void in which the entire creation uh, will be elaborated. When the light of God withdraws, it leaves a residue, in Hebrew called a rishimu, which lines this cavity or this void. From the transcendent light of God, there is a, a, a ray called the kav, which penetrates into the void. So now you can see both the transcendent aspects of the deity outside the void and the, the kav that enters into the void. And what the kav does is it unites, as if it were a masculine component with, within a womb, with the feminine component, which is the rishimu, which then gives rise to the 10 sephirot in concentric circles, with Keter being the most transcendent, closest to the Ein Sof itself, and Malchut, of course, being the central one. There is then a rearrangement of these concentric circles to, pro to produce a hierarchy of the 10 sephirot, which is in the image of man. So we talk about man in the image of God, but here it's, it's in the image of man. In other words, bilateral symmetry, with a right side, a left side, and a central side. The first world that was created that I showed you in a previous slide is called primordial man because of the arrangement of Sephirot, Adam Kadmon in Hebrew. The process of creation that I showed you is reiterated several times, creating a series of worlds from Adam Kadmon, and then it comes Atzilut, Bria, Yitzira, Asiya. And from the very bottom, the Malchut of Asiya is created the physical world. So what this means is that all of these structures above Asiya are all spiritual entities. And each lower one dresses on top of part of the one that is primordial to it. So this is sort of, if you want to use the terms of the physicist David Bohm in terms of Bohmian mechanics, he refers, would refer to all of these worlds as being part of the implicate order, like concentric circles of invisible reality. Uh, finally, uh, there is the expression of the physical world, which according to Bohm would be the explicate order. A, a very important concept germane to this discussion here is that of the 10 sephirot, the top three, either Keter, Chochmah, Bina, or Chochmah, Bina, Dat, depending on your frame of reference, are conscious. They confer consciousness to all structures, be they elephants, electrons, rocks, whatever you have in mind. Everything is made of 10 sephirot, and the, and the top three are its consciousness. The bottom seven, on the other hand, are the body of the object or event and are unconscious. There is a concept in Lurianic Kabbalah that called Shvirata Kelim, which means a shattering of the vessels. When the world of Atsilut was created, initially, there was a mismatch of the infinite light that poured into each of these vessels. In the lower seven, there was this mismatch that resulted in a shattering of the vessels. And this gave rise to the lower worlds, including the world that we are in now, this low world of Asiya. The importance here is that that is why bodily structures, such as even the human body, is made up of innumerable parts. Whereas the conscious sephirot, even though there was a distortion of them during the process of the shattering of the vessels, the top three did not shatter. And this is why the Kabbalah 
construes consciousness as always being unified, regardless of uh, where the consciousness resides, whether it's in a human being or in a, uh, in a tree or in, a, in an electron. Another very important concept um, in Kabbalah is the notion of Hitkalalut in Hebrew or interinclusion. What it states is that the entire whole is recapitulated in each of its parts. Basically, uh, a fractal design or holographic design. So if you look in any sephirah, let's say Keter, you look inside it, it's made of pen sephirah itself, et cetera, et cetera, if you look inside each of these sephirah. This idea of interinclusion has some certain mind-bending uh, implications. Uh, for example, uh, in every electron is enfolded the entire universe, or in every second of time is all of eternity, the distant past and, and the entire future, all contained, hidden, as if in an implicate order, as per David Bohm again, within each fragment of time. So this idea of a holographic universe, uh, although written about in the Kabbalah for the last uh, several millennia, um, came to prominence in the mathematics of the 20th century physicist David Bohm, who described a holographic design of the universe for which there is now physical evidence uh, beginning to accumulate. For example, Bekenstein's work looking at the dynamics at the surface or the event horizon of black holes. There is uh, evidence uh, of a holographic design to the universe. Another uh, significant concept, which is uh, uh, perhaps uh, a little more difficult to appreciate at first glance, is called hit kashrut or interpenetration. I mentioned to you that everything is made of ten sephirah, and there is this hierarchical spread of influence that goes, let's say, down the ten sephirah of this world, and then the malchut of this higher world feeds into the keter of the next world in a sort of uh, like a, a domino effect. But at the same time, there is a cross-cutting or parallel processing whereby any given sephirah, let's say chesed here, which means loving kindness, it is activated or co-activated with all the sephirah of the same type, chesed in this case, throughout the entire um, infrastructure uh, of the entire cosmos. This is occurring concomitantly with the so-called vertical flow of influence, and this cross-cutting mode uh, gives you uh, some uh, idea of the interconnectedness of the entire universe, even though it is not always apparent to our senses. The idea uh, is somewhat reminiscent of the fact that two particles, if they originate from the same progenitor particle, remain anti-correlated uh, regardless of how separated they are in space. They could be at uh, either ends of the universe, and uh, any change in one of the partner particles results in an immediate uh, reciprocal uh, change in the uh, partner particle across the universe, and there is no information traveling at superluminal speeds here. It's a, it's a spontaneity, it's instantaneous, because really, uh, in Bohm's implicate order, for example, these two particles are really part of one thing. They just appear separate in the explicate order. And this is what the idea I'm trying to convey with uh, this interpenetration of Sephiroth throughout the entire uh, fractal infrastructure of the cosmos. So what I mentioned so far is that everything is made of ten sephirot, and the top three are conscious, and the bottom seven are not. Consciousness, according to the Kabbalah, is not the product of, it's not secreted by, it's not emergent within, or the exclusive domain of neural tissue. It's not an epiphenomenon that's bereft of causal action within the material world. It's primordial, 
It is imminent within all of creation and impacts the entire reality, both spiritual and physical. As I mentioned, uh, this diagram uh, reminds us of the fact that the Kabbalah views the consciousness and all of creation as being hierarchical and holographic. In addition, it is also relativistic in an Einsteinian sense. And let me explain to you what I mean by this. The Kabbalah conceives of all of the physical world as being divided into four major groups, domain inanimate objects, where consciousness informs existence in the form of form and substance. A second level of creation, if you will, is the plant life, tzomeach, where consciousness now informs growth and reproduction. A third level is animal life, where consciousness now is responsible for sentience, possibly motion. And finally, medaber, which means speaker, referring to human beings, where consciousness uh, informs self-awareness, rationality, morality, and other uh, human uh, uh, properties that are not present in the animal world. This slide illustrates the uh, relativistic nature uh, of this consciousness through these levels. In this square here, the white represents consciousness space. On the left here is transcendent consciousness. On the right is imminent consciousness in accord with the tenets of panentheism. If you look at a mineral, the first class domain, the mineral is made of 10 sefirot, like everything else. The first three, this is the acronym for first three in Hebrew, Gimel Roshonim, these are the conscious ones. The seven lower ones are unconscious. What these three top sefirot do is they filter from the ground, from the orin saw, from the surrounding mind of God, if you will, a minute bubble of imminent consciousness sufficient to keep that rock in existence. When you look at a plant, an interesting thing happens. The plants do contain minerals, but the mineral, which is made up of 10 sephirot when it's inside uh, itself, basically, when it's isolated, when it becomes incorporated into the plant, the 10 sephirot become compactified into the seven lower unconscious sephirot of the plant as the plant now expresses new consciousness or reveals new consciousness, which is shown here as this bubble of imminent consciousness larger than the one uh, expressed by, by the mineral. And the same thing happens when you move from plant to animal. The 10 sephirot of plant life, which means uh, reproduction and growth, are present in animal life, but the animal now expresses three new uh, se sephirot, which filter uh, a much higher degree of consciousness from the transcendent domain into the imminent domain. And of course, this happens to a much greater extent uh, with, the, with human consciousness. And the Kabbalah recognizes, the Torah recognizes a, an era called Messianic era uh, or the seventh millennium, which is about 220 years from now, during which time there will be a supposedly a, a, a dramatic expansion of imminent consciousness within mankind heading towards a, a, a state of uh, cosmic consciousness or as um, Vishar Dan would put it, like an omega point of, uh, of tremendously expanded consciousness. Another concept that is uh, re relevant to this discussion of um, today is the notion of what the Kabbalah refers to as Reisha, the law is Yada in Hebrew, or Radla, which means unknowable head. The Kabbalah describes this property as a nexus between the intrinsic neural based or imminent consciousness and transpersonal consciousness. And this Radla behaves as what's called a Markov blanket, which Bernardo, I think, is familiar. He's written quite a bit on these Markov blankets. And what it is, Markov blanket, 
is a, an, an, a mathematical object that allows for a microcosm to be embedded within a much more potent macrocosm, but without the microcosm losing its identity. It forms a barrier, and the Rudla um, behaves as a barrier of this type. I've also um, previously published several papers showing that the description of the Radla in Kabbalistic literature, especially from the works of, from the 1700s, uh, is remarkably similar, if not identical, to the operation of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Let me show you what I mean by this. God wills, for example, something to come into creation. Let's call it A, B, C, D. This willing or desire of God occurs in the sphera of Keter, the highest of the sephirot. Within Keter is embedded this Radla. What the Radla does is it scrambles the message, A, B, C, D, into every possible permutation and combination of A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D, B, A, C, D, etc., etc., and it conveys this, this scrambled information throughout the hierarchy, hierarchy of Sephirot until it reaches Malchut, and Malchut, as I mentioned before, is a transducer. It will then produce the product A, B, C, D. This is sort of like a collapse of a, of a wave function, Schrodinger's wave producing all probabilities, uh, which then collapse into a tangible reality once something is observed. Very similar then is the Radla to the idea of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. But where the Kabbalah diverges dramatically from current Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics is the following. When we see ABCD, for all intents and purposes, uh, it could just as easily have been DCDA or BACD. This is a random event. It appears entirely like non-deterministic. But what the Kabbalah acknowledges is the presence of another axis called Keter Malchut, which bypasses the, uh, the main uh, hierarchy of Sephirot, which forces, if you will, Malchut to collapse the wave function to um, be precisely what was initially willed by God in the Sephira Keter. In other words, it could not have been anything other than ABCD. But because our consciousness operates uh, behind or underneath this Rudla membrane, we see these as random stochastic events. Were we able to see things from God's perspective, we would see that ABCD was entirely preordained. There are some enlightened minds that are able in history to, to penetrate this Radla membrane and intuit the will of God before the wave function collapses. And this is what uh, uh, is referred to as prophecy. But many cases of prophecy uh, in the Bible, when it's described, uh, concomitant with the prophetic vision is, a, 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 is an absolute abrogation of any semblance of free will, which we seem to experience because of this Radla membrane acting as a Markov blanket, separating our consciousness from the will of God. So in terms of a formulation uh, uh, of what I've been saying to synthesize it, so Kabbalistic view of consciousness is based on fundamental principles of Jewish mysticism, but it is very much informed by contemporary quantum mechanics, neuroscience, and philosophy. It's clearly panpsychist in nature, informed by the tenets of panentheism, because there's both transcendence of the consciousness as well as imminence. It's arranged hierarchically and holographically and is relativistic and contrary to the, uh, the uh, characteristic the secularist view is capable of downward causation. So ca Kabbalistic panpsychism, like all forms of panpsychism or cosmopsychism, does away with David Chalmers' hard problem of consciousness. 
It explains why consciousness, regardless of how complex it is or how simple it is, it always manifests as a unified whole because the top three sephirot never shattered. It rejects hard uh, distinctions between events and things similar to Whiteheadian philosophy or process philosophy and similar to Bohmian mechanics. Importantly, it neutralizes the combination problem. The combination problem has been uh, uh, used by secularists uh, to challenge panpsychism by asking how is it that uh, rudimentary consciousnesses, let's say in electrons, can combine to form more complex consciousness as we would see in a plant or an animal or in a human being. This challenge is rendered moot by the Kabbalah because it emphasizes the primordial existence of an absolute consciousness, the universal mind or the mind of God, which in a panentheistic fashion differentially reveals itself within the uh, creation hierarchy. Kabbalistic panpsychism uh, suggests that, uh, that, that human consciousness is non-local and may in fact be entangled with transcendent aspects of divinity called the Orma Kif, the sort of transcendent light. And this may account, account for many of the paranormal phenomena, phenomena that have been documented in, in many cultures, such as extrasensory perception, near death experiences, and as I mentioned earlier, prophecy. One final word, um, and based on some epistemology, I try to argue that the Rudla concept in Kabbalah is identical uh, to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. At present, Heisenberg's principle sets up a barrier uh, beyond which uh, quantum physics cannot probe because the actual observation actually changes the thing that you're looking at. If it is true that the Rudla and the Heisenberg's principle are an identical construct, then because we know that the Kabbalah names constructs that are much deeper, higher than the Rudla, this suggests that science may eventually be able to penetrate Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and be able to explore reality with much finer granularity that is currently uh, possible uh, with current um, uh, tools of quantum physics. I'm going to end by um, just mentioning that uh, next year I have a book coming out on this topic called Kabbalistic Panpsychism, where I, uh, I describe in much greater detail uh, some of the parallelisms that exist between quantum mechanics and the Kabbalah, and then use some of these ideas to, um, to uh, understand uh, how the Kabbalah might construe our, uh, artificial intelligence, female intuition, uh, hu even human neuroanatomy, uh, problems encountered in the clinic. Uh, and I conclude by um, uh, describing a Kabbalistic vision of, of human consciousness. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Hyman. This is uh, uh, extremely rich uh, stuff for someone like me. It's like opening a new candy shop for scholarly uh, pursuit. Um, let, let me start uh, with a question of my own. Um, during your day job, you, you're a neurologist. One could say you are a hardcore scientist if there ever was one. Um, and in parallel to that, you have this basically hermeneutic uh, pursuit, the interpretation of uh, sacred texts. Um, is this, uh, the Kabbalah, for you just a scholarly uh, curiosity that you find uh, uh, interesting and enjoyable to, to interpret? Or do you regard it as a uh, admittedly symbolic but potentially uh, uh, legitimate uh, articulation of the nature of reality, and and in the latter case, how do you, how do you reconcile it with your scientific work? <clears throat> this, the, the short answer to your question is the latter. Um, 
uh, I view it uh, uh, more and more as essential, not just a pastime hobby, something to do when I'm not writing scientific papers. Um, and what's stimulating me to spend more and more time looking at these issues. I've always been interested in it. I come from a Hasidic background. I've always been exposed to the Kabbalah in Hasidic works, which is sort of like a bit of a watered down Kabbalah in a sense to make it more palatable to mainstream Judaism. Um, so I've always been exposed to some of these ideas, but it's only in the last, let's say 10, 11 years that I began to to see in a very fundamental way a conflation of Kabbalistic uh, concepts with cutting edge science. And I tried to illustrate a few examples uh, in, in mostly from quantum mechanics, especially uh, the physics of David Bohm. It's as if David Bohm was reading the works of, of, of the Kabbalah of, of, uh, and then translating it into mathematics. That's how I see that. And I'm not totally surprised by that because he was very heavily uh, inf influenced by Jiddah uh, Krishnamurti, who was an Eastern uh, philosopher and mystic who David Bohm held in extremely high regard. And there was always exchange between these two. So uh, I'm not surprised that his physics started to uh, take on a more holistic perspective uh, and a more mystical sounding type of physics. Uh, I wouldn't say his physics is mainstream, but it's become more popular uh, with, uh, I alluded to it in my talk, that there is now evidence uh, that there might be a uh, real 2D program, two dimensional program to the universe, which is read out by our consciousness in three dimensions. In other words, a holographic design. There's more evidence now for this than there was during the lifetime of David Bohm. And as I mentioned, this idea of, uh, of um, hit kalalut or interinclusion is absolutely fundamental in Kabbalistic teachings. So I, I, I hope that answers uh, the question. I, I, I view the conflation as being absolutely essential. It does answer it. Uh, John, you have a question. <laughs> yeah. Um... I, um, I guess because I grew up Catholic, I, I, I have, uh, I'm still interested in, um, in theology and, uh, I, I, all, theology of all kinds. Uh, it seems to me that the central question for all theologians is the problem of evil. If God is just, God loves us, God is all powerful why is the world so painful and unjust? And I just wonder what the answer, if any, is from um, Kabbalistic teachings to the problem of evil. Far be it for me to be able to answer that millennia old question. It's probably the most fundamental question in all of theology. Um, and there is quite a bit that the Kabbalah says about, the, about this notion. I, I, could, I could try to answer it in the simplest way by saying, had this evil not been created, then there would be no good. Good is only, according to the Kabbalah, only meaningful in, in human life if there is a contrast to evil. If, you, if things were uh, in, the, in the realm of, of malachim or angels, uh, there is no free choice. There is just robotic following the commands from on high. Human beings are given the semblance of free choice, which has to include the possibility of committing acts of evil. And in overcoming the tendency to evil and moving towards good, we are fulfilling God's will in the most profound way and also allowing humanity to experience uh, 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 this notion of good, which otherwise would only belong to the deity. We cannot talk about trees as being good or bad. We, don't, we, we do not talk about a tiger stalking its prey as being bad or good. Good and bad only exists because we're given the semblance of free will. Notice I'm saying semblance because as I showed you in one of the slides, Free will is a very, very tricky 
uh, um, uh, concept because from our intents and purposes, for all intents and purposes, we have free will to the best of our ability to experience it. From God's perspective, uh, looking from top down, everything is preordained. That's a paradox. There's no more or less a paradox as light being both uh, uh, energy and matter, uh, particle and wave. We, we accept that as a paradox. We're comfortable now, science is comfortable with paradoxes, and this is a paradox that we need to be comfortable with also. We have free will as far as we are concerned in every meaningful uh, way of looking at it. That's why we should not abolish our courts of law if we're, because we should be still rewarded for our good deeds and punished for our crimes, even though from a uh, feel, from a, uh, from God's perspective, everything is preordained. I can, if I have time, I, I, I would love to give you one more uh, analogy, how to look at the free will um, um, problem and the good evil problem. And the way I, I like to uh, put it is, to view how we understand time. The work of Einstein and others have shown that we probably live in a block universe, which means that the present, past, and future all exist as a block, block of space-time, okay? Yet here in this world that we're put in, it appears that time flows. Past is behind us, doesn't exist anymore, future doesn't, hasn't happened yet, but that is not the way time is looked at from relativity theory because time depends totally on how fast you're moving. And if things are moving at different velocities in the universe, what's my future or somebody else's past? There is just a block of time. Even though we know that Einstein may be right about this, it doesn't mean we should say, okay, because uh, in reality uh, there is a block universe, therefore I should not learn from my mistakes and I should not plan my vacations. That wouldn't make any sense. Similar, similar with, with the, the notion of free will. Even though God knows what we're going to do, it's preordained. He put us in a position where, from our perspective, we uh, have every way of understanding free will um, conceivable at our disposal. Um, are there risky predictions, some, some experiments and certain outcomes <laughs> that would tend to disconfirm these ideas? I, I, I'm, I'm very happy that you asked that question, Donald, because the idea of non-falsifiability is critical to the business of science. Something cannot be scientific if it is, if it is not, at least in potentia, non-falsifiable. That's a given. Theology is not based on that premise. It is not a criterion for theological thinking because much of what has been learned by humanity, regardless of religion, comes through revelation. And revelation is not something you could um, test in a wet laboratory. Jeff. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I have a comment and a question that follows up on Don's. Um, so I know a lot about Kabbalah through Kabbalah scholars, and where I thought you might go is actually the Big Bang um, that Daniel Matt and Richard Friedman, who both engage Kabbalah directly, um, really go to as the best kind of comparative emphasis there. And also the fine tuning problem, which is just this huge problem in cosmology for secular scientists and does suggest some kind of theism uh, mm -hmm. to some people. Um, but I wanna, I wanna make a distinction between theism and Orthodox Judaism, and that's kind of where I'm going here. You know, I, I co-wrote a book with a Jewish woman here in Houston called Changed in a Flash. Her name's Elizabeth Crone, and Elizabeth was struck by lightning in the parking lot of her synagogue in 1988 uh, she, she's a um, reformed Jew here in Houston. Mm -hmm. And she had this very elaborate near-death experience and then became massively precognitive after the lightning strike. And 
as a result of this near-death experience and these series of, of essentially paranormal experiences, she became actually less Jewish. Um, she, she was frustrated with her rabbis. They wouldn't give her the time of day. They, they were not interested in her experience um, be, for whatever reason. But her son, who was also struck by lightning with her, became an Orthodox rabbi. And she found that the, the Hasidic Jews in particular were most sympathetic to her experiences, but she was repelled by their social um, kosher laws and their attitudes towards gender. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at is these experiences, these experiences move people away from their religious traditions as well as pull them closer and i just kind of like to hear you think about that i mean i know enough about orthodox judaism to know that it's extremely exclusionary there's no room in it for me for example um so what do we do with that you know what do we do with these religious traditions that are so ex exclusionary and so based on scriptural texts that are so specific to particular cultures and yet are making these universal claims that are actually quite interesting and, and may in fact have some truth to them. I mean, this is the kind of thing I struggle with. This was the, where the questions were earlier. How do, we, how do we negotiate similarity and difference essentially in these, in these mystical traditions? Because Kabbalists are not particularly open to other traditions, um, oh. as, you, as you well know. Uh, and I mean practicing Kabbalists, you know, in, in Israel. You know, Orthodox Kabbalists are not or just simply are not open. Um, okay. Some are, I'm sure, but but many aren't. Well, there's so many uh, sides to, to your comment. Uh, the you're completely correct that the Kabbalah is not an open book. It's not an open system. The Kabbalah in our tradition was passed on from God to Moses on Mount Sinai along with the oral Torah, which you're familiar with the Mishnah and the Talmud. Except the difference is that the Talmud was passed on through to everybody. There's always uh, been a strong tradition of learning in Judaism for millennia, that everybody had to know what's written uh, in the Torah. The Kabbalah was also oral Torah, except it was passed on to an uh, I don't want to use from elite, but a, but a very, very small number of disciples throughout the generations with little bursts of activity where it entered into the mainstream, uh, for example, in the time of Shimon Bar Yochai in the second century, in the 1500s, in Tzfat in Israel. There were periods of time where this uh, Kabbalistic knowledge sort of burst in the scene and then receded again. So you are, it's not just being kept hidden from Catholics and, 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 other, and other denominations. It's even being kept hidden from most Jews. But we're, I think we, and I'm not the only one to think this, we're entering a period as we approach the seventh millennium where we are told for generations that when we reach this period of time, there's going to be an explosion of the esoteric parts of the Torah, which is the Kabbalah, the Sod, the secret of the Torah, is going to come out. And what gets me really excited is the notion that the very same sciences that have been pulling Jews and Christians away from their tradition for millennia, it is those sciences that are going to be the best uh, modicum of proof for the existence of God because of this conflation that we are now starting to see between uh, constructs of the Kabbalah, like the Radla and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, ideas of inter-inclusion, a holographic universe, the idea of intrinsic or ontic paradox, uh, which is, uh, was anathema to thinkers before the 20th century. Things were thought to be just epistemic paradox. That, the reason why things look paradoxical because we didn't understand them. But now we're starting to learn that paradox is part of the, 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 the it's intrinsic to the creation itself. Just like 
a part, like, like light being both a particle and a wave. Those are opposites, but they're both equally true and we just accept it now. And the same thing I think is going to happen with spirituality and, and, and physics. They're moving very close together. And in terms of Donald Hoff, Donald's comment about predictive value, um, I did make a, a, a somewhat of a prediction that this final axis called the keter malchut axis is something which physics is on, maybe on the verge of discovery, has not yet discovered it, that the collapse of the wave function is preordained. That's a very big step forward. And I believe when that pillar of reality is seen, um, that might complete this so-called theory of everything uh, that people of the physicists have been looking for. Um, so uh, these are some of my, uh, my views on this. Now, I just want to make one more comment. I mentioned that one of the tenets of science is it has to be non-falsifiable, which isn't a criterion for theology. I think everybody would agree with that. But isn't it amazing, because of the, the point you raised, Jeffrey, with, with the, um, the, uh, the, the, the anthropic principle, uh, the, 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 the phenomenal degree of design, 20 parameters that can't be off by 10 to the 20 or something. If they're off by that much, we wouldn't exist. It's fascinating to me how the secularists are so bothered by this that they now cling to a multiverse. And guess what? The multiverse is non-falsifiable either. So is it science? No, it's, it's belief. But it's a belief they're more comfortable than say, hey, you know, a deity makes sense. They don't like that idea. I understand that. They have the right to choose. And the last point I'll make, also based on your comment, Jeffrey, is that I know people that are incredibly intelligent. Some of them are theistic in their outlook completely. And the more every fact they learn makes them bigger believers. Then I have people equally intelligent. And with every scientific fact they learn, they distance themselves, like the uh, anecdote you gave with the, your co-author, uh, the, 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 the two that one became more religious, one less religious. The reason why that happens from a Kabbalistic point of view is that is what is absolutely necessary to preserve our sense of free will, free choice. Bechira. If it was such that the more knowledge you, you got, you immediately clinged to the existence of a deity, you'd lose, your, you'd lose your free choice. It's so beautifully designed that no matter who you are, how smart you are, there's always free choice in the picture. And some choose to believe in a multiverse, and some feel that things are exquisitely designed.